you're with another episode from the Stellar Sound podcast, and I'm your host for today, Radina. Today we're going to be speaking with a very interesting band. I think at least very interesting, because I personally was not before a big fan of black metal in particular, but other types of metal. And then I heard a song of theirs and I thought, okay, I can vibe with that. So we're going to be speaking with Darko, right? Or how do you pronounce Dachas or is it? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Dachas. It's uh, Dachas. Yeah, my nickname back in Serbia. But when you start, uh, you know, going internationally, people are more confused with my nickname than my real name. And they're <laughs> also asking like, oh, Darko, cool nickname. What's, what's your real yeah. name? I'm like, Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Donnie Darko, like this. <laughs> yes. My, my real name. Anyways, but uh, you're part of Carnival of Flesh. And today we're going to talk a bit more about that project. And because I know the band has gone through many stages as well throughout the years. So curious to know more about that. But let's first start with you and your introduction. Now, who are you? What do you do in the band? Yeah. So, uh, hi, I'm Dachas. I'm originally from Serbia, but living in the Netherlands uh, for the last 11 years. Uh, I'm co-founder uh, slash uh, vocal slash lyrics slash manager uh, of Carnival of Flesh. Uh, and yes, my professional management career is seeping into my band as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We started the band, uh, you know, a long, long time ago, back in 2002 as a high school uh, project. Uh, at that time, uh, we were um, very optimistic in kind of reshaping the black metal scene of uh, Serbia, which yeah. at the time, uh, it had some nice parts, but it, it was kind of traditionally rooted. Uh, mm -hmm. And we were at the point of, uh, well, listening to a lot of uh, symphonic black metal coming from France, from Scandinavia as well, mm -hmm. and being like, well, it does not uh, always have to be about Satanism. It does not always have to be the, you know, raw anti-religion part. Uh, so we yeah. wanted to find uh, a deeper meaning closer to us, uh, not uh, devaluing the meaning uh, that other bands are, are following, but it did not First, resonate yeah. uh, with us. But as you might imagine, uh, a couple of high school kids uh, trying to put uh, serious uh, things <laughs> together, yeah. uh, that didn't really work out. Uh, so we had many, many personnel changes uh, over time. And I think that it was 2008 when we officially gave up. Uh, and uh, 2012, I moved to Netherlands. And uh, as it goes, when you have a nice, cozy, uh, worry-free life, you get a little bit bored. Uh, so uh -huh. around 2013, yep. I started reaching out uh, to uh, Dan, uh, who is the co-founder slash keyboard player uh, and uh, main composer for the first album uh, and also one of the main composers for the second album. Uh, and it, I started just with, uh, what if we recorded that demo that we never did? Uh, <laughs> to which uh, he used the phrase which uh, challenges people from Balkans. Yes, that would be great, but uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh -huh. Challenge uh, yeah. accepted. <laughs> I definitely resonate with that, yes, coming from the Balkans as well, yes. Yeah. So, uh, 2013, uh, we looked at the songs that we had written a long, long time ago, uh, looked at uh, where they are, uh, how we can do something with that. Uh, we selected uh, six of them, uh, reshaped them a little bit, uh, you know, uh, because some of them were written in very early stages of the band. Uh, so like 2004, uh, some were written closer to the official breaking point of 2008. Uh, but we also needed to update them a little bit uh, to keep with um, the original idea of we want to uh, tell a story, we want uh, to find something that uh, you know resonates with us. And then in 2014, we started off uh, kind of as a studio project, uh, getting uh, some of the best people we could find back in Serbia, uh, finding really uh, impressive drummer, a really impressive producer who really bought into the story. He uh, really lived through our super terrible demo. Uh, and he really <laughs> heard the potential of that super terrible demo. Yeah. Uh, and then as we were recording our In Our Brains demo, uh, it started sounding like uh, proper music. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as we were uh, driving back from a very intense uh, week in the studio, because uh, as you might imagine, 
me living in the Netherlands, uh, Dan being at that time in Serbia, uh, and yeah. other musicians uh, who were at that time session uh, being in Serbia, I had to take some holidays, uh, and then it was mm -hmm. really, you know, none of, of that romantic, we're in a studio creating things together, but like, no. Never is, a, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a work <laughs> engagement, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So after that very intense week, uh, the producer just gave us uh, the first, not even like a, a mix, but you know, just uh, here, here's uh, from one of the songs, here's just like all the layers, one on top of each mm -hmm. other, without anything done to them. Uh, and we were driving back uh, from uh, Kragujevac, a city in uh, like mid-south uh, Serbia, back to Belgrade, where we're from, listening to that and being like, well, fuck, now we have to continue with this because this sounds so much better than what we Now did. you gotta make something yeah, really out of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so those were the starts and uh, yeah, then it uh, took us uh, a few years to, to get into a full uh, live setup. Uh, so our first gig was in 2016 uh, and that um, ended up surprisingly well. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you imagine that, you know, like it started as a high school band that was never successful. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, studio project, you have a lot of room to air in a in studio, but mm -hmm. then doing the actual first gig where of course we wanted to go over the top so uh that there were maybe more things that we did that we potentially should not have for the first gig but it all added <laughs> to that feeling of so i'm not sure how it is in bulgaria but in serbia one of the best reviews you can get is they sound like a foreign band uh <laughs> yeah well you can imagine yeah i think it's exactly the same for bulgarian especially when it's about a scene that we don't really have let's say yeah. uh, in a particular genre like metal scene in bulgaria is also quite um, let's say going into the classic types like heavy metal that's it but not really venture venturing in other styles so yeah so yeah. Uh, we were pretty proud to have received uh, <laughs> the top <laughs> praise possible <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, uh, got us uh, rolling again. Uh, so uh, very quickly, well, very quickly after, uh, it was actually a year and a half later, uh, we did a European tour. Uh, it was uh, 16 days, 14 cities. Uh, it was quite intense. Uh, yep. and it was uh, one of the, you know, like most beautiful experiences that, that I had. So as you might imagine, you know, it, it was uh, not, uh, on the level of, um, I don't know, Dimu uh, Borgir, Satyricon, whatever, you know, those uh, A, A level uh, bands. Uh, it was a lot of uh, small venues, it was a lot of bad promotion, but uh, it was also a lot of learnings. Uh, and yeah. uh, one thing that I really, really enjoyed um, the atmosphere that we had in, in the van. Uh, so, like, there, there was no bickering, no fighting, no egos. We were just all in it, like, yeah, we're traveling we're playing uh if we're playing for 100 people or if we're playing for one person they're gonna get mm -hmm. the same show uh and it was uh, it was really uh really fulfilling you know just the musical and uh lyrical part of it uh, for us you know the visual identity uh, behind it is very important so uh i worked with our original uh, designer and cover artist uh um i have to say i i was gonna mention that because i really really like the cover art thank you I, I was going to ask you like about the logo and the cover art of uh, anthems of extinction it's beautiful yes so um the cover art uh, was also a project which uh, we worked on uh, I don't remember how many months, but it started with uh, me just reaching out to uh, to our uh, designer, Stefan, and being like, okay, what's your availability? When can you start working on this? I don't have strict deadlines for you, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, here's the music, uh, here are the lyrics, uh, and, you know, let, let's start uh, brainstorming on it. And I, funnily enough, uh, sent those messages just before Christmas and New Year's, expecting that he will tell me like see you in february or something like that you know yeah uh the dude was like oh well uh, i have time of work i'm gonna start tomorrow <laughs> okay uh <laughs> and because my timelines were uh like i expect to get something back from him by end of april or something like that starting in december and working until i don't know if it was april may where it was but it was uh it was a few months 
meant that we had a lot more time uh, to, to be creative and to explore mm -hmm. much further than just the uh, cover art because uh, I don't know if you uh, looked through the booklet as well, but uh, you know, for every song, uh, we uh, created a conceptual visual, which yeah. is something that we did before as well. So for the first album, uh, we also did like a set of uh, tarot cards, uh, one for each song. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here we didn't want to repeat ourselves, but uh, also yeah. we wanted it's to... It's different. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I know that this was a little bit extensive. Uh, I, I no, I like... <laughs> I, I'm really glad you did that actually, because it gives... I, I feel like uh, a lot of people don't really know, even if they're fans of black metal, okay, in general, they don't really know about the Serbian scene, but that's also why we are doing this here. Maybe you are the Serbian scene, I mean, <laughs> in, a, in a sense, you know, with black metal and especially uh, symphonic black metal, because it's a bit yeah, different. Uh, but thank you for the overview. I have a lot of things I want to ask, but um, let me see. I rewind to when you were talking about the story, because you mentioned that a couple of times. So I know um, in the social, at least what I saw was that you you mentioned your eco activists, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so is that the story that you're talking about, like general theme, or is there something else? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Anthems of Extinction is really like uh, eco activist, uh, social political uh, album. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did we get there? So um, for us, it was always important to to tell a story uh, and not to have you know. Uh, just you know a bunch of good riffs a bunch of uh, lyrics that go nicely with those good riffs and then whatever happens right mm -hmm. uh, yeah and again uh, please take everything that I'm saying uh, with the utmost respect possible I do not want to people to feel badly if that's the type of music they like or like making yeah. that is absolutely okay but uh, just not yours yeah so our, our take was always a little bit more theatrical a little bit more mm -hmm. over the top and then, sure, uh, are we at the level where we can uh, confidently say that we are over the top? Possibly not, because, I mean, with all the Alice Coopers and uh, Wasps and whatever of the world... and <laughs> Bloody avatars, stuff on stage, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, like, we, we are infants uh, in comparison to that. But uh, when we looked at the type of music that we listened to, that we uh, really, really appreciated, uh, it was always story-based. So uh, from classics like King Diamond, where each mm -hmm. album is a, a beautiful horror story, to Edge of Sanity's Crimson, uh, you know, like where uh, for us it was a, a massive mind blow that a full album is one song of 45 minutes. And sure, it, it was a musical expression and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And yes, it's an album. It has different songs in it, but it's one song and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah. So with that kind of background, uh, the first album was Stories from a F Fallen World, which was uh, more magical, more, uh, let's say, let's have this horror story, which is not fully detached from reality, but it is a little bit more detached. So, uh, you know, the underlying meaning was a little bit uh, under the wraps, if you will. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can take it on the face you value. You can interpret, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can take it on the face value. You can be like, oh yeah, it's a nice horror story and be done with it. You can clearly go digging a little bit deeper and get to the story uh, of, uh, you know, like, be careful what you wish for uh, and, you know, dealing with consequences of our desires, of our, yep. uh, you know, uh, uh, appetites, if you will. Uh, and then uh, as we were writing the second album, uh, we were, again, trying to uh, stay with the storytelling moment because that that is... Uh, Kind of the core uh, of, of our band but then uh, going back to what I said about Satanism and finding our identity uh, so I was kind of deconstructing what is the story behind Satanism and what is the story behind that particular uh, vibe of, of uh, metal uh, and it really made sense because it came from uh, from a place of oppression a place where mm -hmm. people were not uh, comfortable with uh, religion being shoved down their throats and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, and then we reflected on there was a period uh, in our upbringing where we felt uh, like too big presence of religion in Serbia, uh, the kind of mafia aspect of uh, organized religion in Serbia, uh, and that even the 
our religious friends that we really hold dear uh, distance themselves from the Orthodox Church because yeah. of uh, of those parts. But then we also reflected on how small of an impact it had on our adult lives. Uh, and also for me living in Netherlands, I mean, yes, religion is present in Netherlands, but at a very, uh, I don't want to say irrelevant aspect because that's uh, not entirely true, but when you live in Amsterdam, you tend not even to see it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we looked at what are the things really pressing us uh, as the adults uh, that we are today. Uh, and that was this, uh, this uh, as the first song says, angst uh, of uh, where, where is our planet heading to? Where is the yeah. society heading to? Uh, and it is a little bit of, um, um, I don't want to say a- any sort of manifesto, but it is kind of like um, a recipe book, how to uh, successfully uh, extinct, uh, to get a uh, civilization extinct, mm-hmm. uh, how to successfully, through all the different flavors, um, just destroy everything that we were building, uh, and how to uh, embrace the insanity. Uh, and of course, uh, you can just take it on the face value where we're inviting you to do those things. Uh, but uh, actually what we are trying to do uh, with lyrics like that is to uh, get people to think uh, and yeah, to, uh, raise the awareness. to see, you know, like what, what is their place in all of that? Are they comfortable uh, with that place? Uh, do they want to be part of it? Uh, and then, sure, we're, we're not going to be out there starting a revolution or anything like that. But we just want people to think. Uh, and mm-hmm. if people are not comfortable thinking while they're listening to our music, well, then at least we hope they have a good time enjoying our music. <laughs> yeah, in, in both scenarios, there is something to be gained, but it depends on the listener, too. And I, I thought when I looked through a tropical plunder, it yeah. was, right? I was almost saying Tropical Thunder because it really goes together, but Tropical Plunder. Uh, first, the title itself is interesting, an interesting choice, uh, but also I really enjoyed the visual aspect to it because you have the video on uh, YouTube, so you can freely, anyone can uh, freely check it. Um, I was wondering a couple of things. So first, the visual aspect, uh, whose idea was it uh, and what exactly do you represent if you even want that to be clear out there for people? or do you want it to be more like okay we leave it up to you yeah no. so I'm, I'm i'm happy to to scratch a little bit uh on it uh so uh first about the name um it is uh twofold so it is again what it says on the tin uh so uh, how we're uh plundering resources uh and it has a little bit of a tropical team because it's mm-hmm. talking about rising sea levels and and whatnot yeah uh, but it also has that part of um, a black metal band is not allowed to use words tropical. Uh, uh, yeah, that was also going to be my thing. I loved it that it's not the cliche because, okay, I just upon looking at the title, I wouldn't have imagined, okay, that's a black metal sound. No, yeah. uh, I'm not going to be expecting that. So good yeah. job. Yes, uh, and uh, Tropical Blunder as a song uh, is a very dividing song on on our uh, latest album. Uh, So we absolutely love it. uh, And that's also why we chose that to be the first video single. Uh, It is maybe the most unusual thing uh, we've done um, with the, you know, orchestrations in the beginning and Mm -hmm. uh, the whole progression of the song. But it is uh, like all of us really absolutely adore this song. So uh, you're not supposed to have a favorite child. We do. It's Tropical Plunder. (laughs) Uh, So, but uh, some people uh, did not appreciate the uh, diversity of the song or the unusualness of the song or whatever uh, you want to call it, because uh, there were some reviewers saying, uh, you know, the band is trying to achieve the sound they are not comfortable with and whatnot. While I can appreciate that, because maybe this is not our default sound, uh, Mm -hmm. we also uh, don't really want to be um, a band that has like overly specific sound. And I know that Mm -hmm. we do have a sound. We clearly do have a sound. Uh, Some people might even uh, debate if that sound is natively ours or if we, uh, you know, reappropriated other people's sound, whatever. But uh, at least 
we find ourselves in a certain spectrum, but we find that spectrum to be very broad. But anyway, so that, that's about the initial story about the song, but uh, the video, uh, it, was, uh, it was a bit scrappy project, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, so um, again, with the whole, uh, I'm living in one country, the rest of uh, the band is in another country, uh, we got in touch uh, with a really good friend and, uh, well, nowadays professional filmmaker, but at the time uh, not really professional filmmaker. Uh, so uh, Igor Jimmy Stanic, who is a very active on Serbian metal scene, uh, he had a couple of his own bands like uh, Super Hammer uh, and a couple other projects. Uh, and um, we were essentially reaching out to a number of uh, videographers in Serbia uh, kind of the same uh, like initially when we were reaching out to producers uh, to find somebody who would understand what we're trying to achieve and to work with us on that. So we found Jimmy uh, and um, he clearly knew us from before. The two of us knew each other from internet presence because both of us were at certain point in time very present in Serbian metal uh, or Yugoslav metal at the time even, uh, so whatever. Um, and yeah, he was very, very happy to, uh, to start working with us. Uh, and then we started just bouncing some ideas on what we want to capture uh, in the video. Uh, yeah. Again, the lyrics are so packed uh, with, uh, with symbolism. Uh, so I actually you know, wrote a little dissertation uh, where I'm taking each, uh, each uh, two lines and uh, writing a, a small story uh, next to it. I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, I wow, know if yeah. I publicly share that, but. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I would be curious to have it, yeah. Uh, so, you know, like there, there is again a lot more uh, happening in that song than what's, what's the, the face value. And yeah. we wanted to just give a little bit of uh, the complete vibe of that story in the video. Uh, and the let's say the smallest digestation that we could do is this uh, part of uh, humanity and uh, modern industrial humanity oppressing nature uh, mm -hmm. through very you know symbolic interaction of me representing humanity uh, our very close friend Lubica being initially nature then you know succumbing to to our influence uh, and again so this is just like a thin line out of the full story uh, but we didn't with the first video we didn't really want to overwhelm uh, yeah. we are doing that with our second video which is going to come uh, 1st of January when? 1st of January? <laughs> yes wow okay happy new year next year uh, we'll remember that date <laughs> Yeah, so the, the first video uh, is more uh, ambiental, uh, more, um, yeah, so kind, kind of artistic, uh, if you will. Uh, the second one is a lot more story driven uh, and a mm -hmm. lot more, uh, so while the first one was calmer with uh, slower cuts, uh, the, the second one is going to be a little bit more intense uh, with a little bit uh, uh, quicker cuts. Uh, and it is also for a song which is, uh, kind of diametrically opposite uh, from uh, from uh, Tropical Plunder, where, yeah. again, Tropical Plunder is uh, very symphonic. Uh, the One, uh, which is the next uh, music video, uh, starts uh, literally in a good old uh, black metal fashion with a punch to your face. Uh, yeah. And the, the whole uh, song is pretty high tempo. Uh, so there we decided to, uh, to do, uh, again, the opposite and see also uh, a little bit like how people react to that. Uh, so yeah. do they like uh, that style as well? Because uh, in that one, uh, we really tried to uh, capture a lot of what's happening in the lyrics to capture also on screen uh, mm -hmm. and to also add uh, a little bit of those hidden layers uh, on the screen uh, as well. And maybe we were successful in achieving that, maybe not, uh, we, we will see. Uh, but uh, so uh, that was the experimentation with that one as well. And maybe to go a little bit back to Tropical Plunder once again, uh, that, so that was our first uh, official music video. Uh, before that, we were just releasing a couple of, uh, you know, from gigs uh, recordings. Yeah. But uh, this one uh, somehow got uh, onto the Serbian national music channel's uh, uh, song of the month voting. Mm -hmm. We 
have no clue because like <laughs> we, we didn't initiate it. Normally bands send stuff to, to the media. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had very uh, weak support at that time uh, from Serbian media. Uh, and we were like, okay, this happened. Uh, so we just shared it like, you know, people, you can go voting. It's, it's funny seeing, uh, you know, symphonic black metal and then kind of uh, power pop uh, and then uh, <laughs> the pop thing. And it's like, it's all mixed together and like, sure. Such a mishmash, uh, you're uh, there, yeah. And we, we expect it to be somewhere close to the bottom uh, of the voting list. And then we won uh, and we were like, um, absolutely wow. never guessed. So absolutely <laughs> never guessed. And it was, uh, it was a really nice wind uh, because that happened in a period where, so we recorded the album, uh, we were uh, looking for publishers. Uh, we did a gig on a festival in Serbia and mm -hmm. after the gig, we got the results of the vote uh, and we uh. won. Uh, and it was like, okay, we had a fantastic gig. Uh, what a timing yeah, yeah we had this great and then the funniest of the funny things was that that video because it won it got aired on serbian national television uh, mm -hmm. i read about that yeah yeah so like uh <laughs> i was here in the netherlands uh you know uh, subscribing to one of those uh, internet uh, tv things just to be able to watch <laughs> my music video on serbian national television because it, it it just didn't add together, right? So, it's super surreal. And I guess when you're also not in the location, so not in Serbia in that moment, you kind of feel even more detached in a way. You're not really detached. Of course, you're, oh, you know, it's my band, it's happening. But a bit more like an observer of the observer, if you know what I mean. Very Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And also with what you said uh, like a few moments ago that, uh, you know, metal and black metal and symphonic black metal are not really recognized in Bulgaria. In Serbia, like, uh, let, let's say either the same, maybe a little bit more, but mm -hmm. mainstream media and governmental national television, like... It doesn't happen that they... It just know. doesn't happen. So yeah. that, that was the most uh, amazing thing that uh, happened to us. Uh, we also were... Uh, you know, credits where credits due. We were featured on Croatian music television. Uh, mm -hmm. That was much easier because just they have a healthy music program and they play everything from the region. Uh, so, yep. you know, that, that, that I respect, but I'm not uh, mm -hmm. surprised with, but this was completely, you know, blowing things out of the water. And ironically enough, uh, so our uh, next music video, uh, the one uh, is uh, dedicated to uh, all the great leaders in the world, uh, you know, from uh, Boris Johnson to Kim Jong-un to Donald Trump to uh, our beloved uh, uh, president uh, in, in Serbia, uh, to use the politically correct terms. Uh, so <laughs> it is an uh, instruction manual on how to rule your people and drive them into the ground and remove all the freedoms uh, from them. Mm -hmm. If we manage to get that one on national television, I, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, freedom exists somehow, you know, <laughs> right? You, you, by now, I'm getting this picture in my head. You like doing the reverse psychology on people <laughs> with, <laughs> with yes. your themes and topics. Yeah, yes. that's, uh, that's lovely. But the contrast is quite good then. So tropical plunder being you know, like a bit more like it's very melodic, I would say. It's really yeah. melodic, like the symphonic um, elements just so overthrowing uh, the rest. And then you have the really uh, where maybe real very classic black metal fans will be more happy with if uh, maybe i'm a bit biased but yeah that's how uh, i see it that maybe they will be like okay yes that's what we're looking feel? for because at least um i know a couple artists that have this distinction that they experience it but do you feel the same so uh, your image or let's say a mask that you have while you're performing or within the music is that actually a mask for you or do you feel it really is you as a person and represents you as well? Or is there a clear distinction? Uh, that is a, a really, really good question. And that is a really tough one as well, because yeah. um, it, uh, it also changes over time. So uh, I was asked a similar question back in the time of her first album. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I had a little bit of uh, kind of split uh, of what songs were more personal 
and what songs were more um, kind of observational, where it yeah. was like social commentary, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, for some it was kind of putting myself really uh, into the song. So that, at, on the first album I, I had more of that cut. Uh, on this album, uh, and again, so this is not directly answering your question because I'm now first taking a, a stab at the lyrics, uh, but then we're gonna yeah. get to the stage persona as well. So mm -hmm. the lyrics of the second album, uh, even though they're social commentary, uh, there is, I would say, a lot more personal notes uh, in that because yeah. a lot of it is based on first-hand experiences uh, and first-hand emotions uh, and, um, you know, first-hand observations. Uh, so yeah. uh, I would say that definitely I identify a lot more with the lyrics of the new album which, you know, is good because if it was the other way around, we should reconsider our career. <laughs> but, uh, so, Got you. Yeah, that's on the lyrical aspect, on the performing aspect. Um, I don't know, uh, because uh, there is a little bit of a difference of the person that's there on the stage uh, and the person that, uh, that I am in a private and professional life. Um, Usually what I heard from uh, my friends, uh, you know, like observing the two people is that they yeah. see a big difference uh, that, you know, the person on the stage is, uh, you know, kind of larger than life and, and all of that, uh, which is part of, of the theatrical approach that we have and, you know, like sure. the, how, how we understand uh, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, music and performance and performative arts uh, altogether. But then also uh, there is an incredibly big part of the actual who I am in all of that because, um, for example, like the uh, set pieces, the how we present ourselves, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about that uh, and planning that uh, up to the point where uh, for this music video, the, uh, the second one that, that we're doing, I spent a lot of time making the props themselves because uh, it was like uh, I, one example is I, I needed an ancient book uh, and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. how, how do I achieve that? And especially with uh, being in Netherlands, shooting Serbia, uh, what can I do remotely? Uh, what uh, you know, can I expect people to do for me over there and stuff like mm -hmm. that? And uh, um, as you might imagine, uh, later in uh, that day of brainstorming, uh, my girlfriend just came over and said, like, are you really looking how to do hand book binding? I was like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my weekend project, right? And uh, so there is a little bit of that perfectionist uh, mm. person in there. And yeah. uh, I would try to uh, steer away from the perfectionist label because... Uh, you know, uh, professionally, I deal with uh, managing people and also, you know, uh, building things and whatnot, where 80% uh, is usually more than what you need. So usually you need like 57% and not even 80%. So I'm uh, trying to balance that uh, because clearly, you know, I want to, to give the best show to everybody, to give the best mm -hmm. experience, to give them something they're going to remember. But then also uh, I have to tone it down with uh, a yeah. little bit of uh, realism of we do not have uh, an infinite budget. Uh, we do not have mm -hmm. uh, a huge marketing uh, company backing us. Uh, and then what is realistic that we can do? Uh, so those parts are very much ingrained in this uh, persona that you see on the stage. And then, you know, if we take like two steps back, um, what I said with, you know, this person on stage is larger than life and whatnot, and some of my friends uh, see a big difference in that. Um, if I compare with this professional note that, that I mentioned, uh, in all of my previous companies, uh, people saw those two people, uh, so those two personas in my professional behavior as well. Uh, because, you know, when I need to represent the people or when I need to speak on a conference or whatever, I still have this kind of entertainer per persona, mm -hmm. this very vocal uh, persona, but then I'm also uh, going to be the person on the other side who's quiet and listening to your problems and not 
uh, you know, speaking over you, but and yeah. I'm aware that today I'm talking a lot, but you're interviewing me. No, but, that, <laughs> but. That, I mean, that's the circumstance, you know, the circumstances really make for the behavior a lot of times. And if you are a sensitive person who actually has some empathy and can read the room, then I would think it's just more than normal to have this kind of attitude and to adapt slightly. So, yeah, and it, mm -hmm. it, it is very important. And it is a funny thing, you know, and I uh, apologize a little bit for pulling a lot of this uh, professional stuff into it. But, uh, uh, you know, at some point uh, in your managerial career, you get all kinds of education on communication and, mm -hmm. like you, said, you know, reading the room, optimizing your communication yeah. style and whatnot. And those are the things that do not apply just to professional environment. They apply mm -hmm. to human interaction. Uh, and it's, you know, to a certain extent sad that we're not taught that earlier in our lives but you know yeah if you decide to go on this career path and you get to a certain level then you get some of that training also sad and very troublesome that a lot of my peers uh, who are supposed to you know really max out on those skills um, don't take them very seriously because yeah. you know i didn't become a manager because of my soft skills i became because i'm the best in what i do uh, of course, I'm making it more graphical than it is, but uh, yeah. But to illustrate a point, yeah, I get yeah. I get what you mean. So, uh, so yeah, it, it is uh, interesting, interesting, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> interesting for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a, an interesting question also for me to use that word uh, back because um, I like asking it uh, to people because I feel like. Um, Oftentimes, uh, there is this understanding that when you're an artist, you have to be in a certain way, you're in a certain way on stage, you have to behave, you have to be the extrovert type. And you, you really, you know, in order to perform, you have to be like this. And I also often get this question back from people, but how, why, why do you say you're an introvert? Uh, because you perform on stage. So that's kind of, it. how do you reconcile this? But it's not necessarily i at least don't see it as as a conflict it's a, a different setting it's a different circumstance it's a different part it calls for a different part of you and i just always i'm so curious to how other people that are performing or in some way creatives how they perceive it how they how it is for them of course i know some people that have a very thin distinction so it's almost you can't even notice it they are exactly the same person all around on stage personal whatever um but most of the people i know and my friends that are creative are the opposite so they 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 reveal a different part I'm of them. if you have any dates planned for touring performing or yeah. whatnot uh so um we were supposed to uh, do a small tour in Serbia uh, end of last year because we released the album in November. The plan was uh, let's do album promotion tour in December. Yeah. Uh, and so Serbia at that time was fairly open. And then just as we started uh, talking to the venues, uh, they started introducing QR codes. Uh, unlike mm -hmm. Netflix, yeah. where people are more comfortable with that in Serbia, that just meant nobody's going anywhere. Uh, yes, yeah, same in Bulgaria. So yeah. we postponed it until spring this year. Uh, around that time, our uh, long-term drummer decided to leave us uh, just before we started choosing the dates. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're scrambling to find a replacement. As you might yeah. imagine, finding a replacement, uh, somebody who needs to learn like one and a half albums overnight, uh, that's not happen overnight. Yep. Um, so uh, we think we found uh, uh, our new drummer. Uh, and uh, when we were shooting the new music video, uh, we also met uh, with him in person, uh, did a, a little bit of a rehearsal session that sounded um, you know, the way it should sound. Uh, mm -hmm. so that gave us some confidence. But then we were again getting to this, it's uh, end of the year, uh, we need to practice more in this new setup because uh, to you know roll a little bit back uh, with, that, uh, with this uh, multi-geo setup, uh, you don't get the luxury of your usual rehearsals once a week or twice a week or whatever. Yeah. So it was really um, the very professional touring kind of setup where everybody rehearses uh, in their own capacity and then we just have sometimes even one uh, general rehearsal uh, and yeah. if we're lucky like two or 
did we ever have three? <laughs> but uh, the, that's pushing it now. <laughs> yeah. No, so the the last time we played, we had the general rehearsal in the morning of the day that we played the festival. Uh, oh. So you know that that was cutting in really close. But again, it's the group of people that's very experienced. The group of people mm -hmm. that worked together a lot, uh, and yeah. we even though we were playing new songs on that festival. It was easy because we already, you know, knew how how all of it works. When you uh, change uh, a few people in a band, then it becomes more complicated. So that's why now we're hopefully aiming for spring next year as well. Uh, I will not commit. <laughs> yes. as, uh, Let's not jinx it. Yes. But uh, that's the goal. We know what happened last time, but uh, yeah. So again, why spring? Just to be. Uh, as corona proof as possible because uh, if we have new set of restrictions uh, that we could play outdoors uh, where it would be a little bit more loose uh, but mm -hmm. that that is smaller factor now if i'm completely honest the bigger factor is uh, just getting getting the new uh, lineup uh, to the level that we want uh, to be again to to perform yeah that was about the well, your rebellion let's say because usually in metal or these harsher styles there is always some kind of internal rebellion you talked about the story mm -hmm. so the echo side of it so on but is there personally for you some kind of rebellion that makes you or urges you to create music that's more personal to you and you can't drop the music because of it uh, so that, that is a good one because, uh, like it is maybe a, a bit hard for me to detach the two, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, like I was thinking many, many times of, um, what we're doing with carnival. Like I, I love it. I invested so much of myself in it, but does it make sense with the uh, different countries, with all the logistical problems with, yes us getting older, having families, kids, whatnot, uh, and all, all that goes with that, where I wanted to kind of try like, okay, can, can I have a different band? Can, can I uh, do something that's completely here, that's completely not related to Carnival and then mm -hmm. you know, like have two bands or whatever. Uh, and I realized that uh, Carnival is like really a big part of who I am uh, and a big part of me is in there. Uh, yeah. And that might be good, might be bad, but it's creating a hard, um, you know, hard time for me to detach and to say like, oh yeah, this is this is our message as a group. Yeah. And this is me in my internal <laughs> rhythm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so from from that kind of aspect, there is a very tight bond there. And for the parts of uh, is there something constantly pushing me towards music? There definitely is uh, because uh, you know. Also, how we rebooted Carnival was my life became so normal and so boring that uh, I just missed that creative outlet. Uh, yeah. And so maybe that is also kind of the duality of uh, of my persona, where what I said, you know, like I'm very technical, uh, systematic, whatnot. But mm -hmm. uh, then also my creative side is like, hello, I'm I'm present as well. I'm uh, here as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me some attention. Exactly. Uh, and. Uh, it is uh, interesting because so music is not my only creative outlet. So I'm I'm really into photography, uh, and uh, there were periods of time where I was dedicating like a stupid amount of time into my uh, hobby because you know I never earned any money of it. While people mm. were like, "But your photography is really professional grade," I'm like, "But I'm not doing it for that. You know, I, I have a profession and it's well paid, and I don't want to, yeah. you know, switch switch to this." So th this was really kind of me pouring my creative uh, soul out into photography. And what I realized is that, um, well, we don't have unlimited amount of time, so uh, my creative outlet sometimes is photography, sometimes is carnival. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, something weird like uh, building a book by hand for Carnival. Uh, <laughs> book binding, wow, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, there, there was always this uh, creative part. And maybe, you know, uh, if, if I do like a little bit more introspection. Um, so at the beginning of my professional career, uh, I was building websites, which meant uh, next to the coding part, which was 
you know, like the part that I really enjoyed and uh, where yeah. my profession uh, is. Uh, it came with the design part because uh, mm -hmm. when you're, you know, a small nobody from Serbia, uh, you cannot just be like, I'm the best coder, find your designer. Uh, so my creative outlet was building those uh, designs. And then over time, uh, as I went into more professional software engineering careers, that uh, design part uh, kind of disappeared, but it was all yeah. with me in some capacity. But then I think that because I didn't have that, uh, like, uh, la not layer, but level of creativity that I apparently need, then the band came back. Uh, and then <laughs> when the band was again on hold because, uh, you know, we were um, in between albums or whatever, then it was like, okay, let's do photography now. And uh, yeah, so uh, I guess that that is uh, just how I try to balance the left and right side of my brain. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was listening to you and I was thinking the same thing. Like, uh, okay, that's a, that's a good balance between both sides, both yeah. hemispheres. Yeah. Good job, and and I guess uh, you know the versatility of it also helps you because when you have when you're a creative person, um, sometimes it can even what you're creative with can become a, boring to you, or, or you might not find the same enthusiasm that you had unless you spice it up with something else. Either you spice it up, or you just find a different niche. And like with you with the photography, then uh, some people do the cooking as well, and they or okay, you you also do cooking. Yes. All right. <laughs> Then, yeah, so different versatile uh, ways to express it. No, but Great. You, you really hit the nail on the head because uh, also what was happening with, uh, with my photography uh, was that I was really reaching those uh, levels where it should be professional, where yeah. uh, one set of people were asking, like, why is it not in a gallery? And the other set of people was asking, why are you not making money of this? Uh, where I was like, but it's my creative outlet. But then... <laughs> my, uh, you know, um, high standards for everything in life, uh, which we covered already. Uh, yes, are perfectionism. Also, let's not call it that. <laughs> okay, also, that's a negative connotation. Sorry, it's not. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they're also creating this pressure, as you said, uh, because so um, that's why now if I travel somewhere and I take my, uh, you know, high-end camera with, uh, and I take photos, it's going to take years before uh, those photos are published because I cannot just, you know, publish snaps like normal people mm -hmm. uh, who share with their families, like, look, I saw this thing. I'm like, no, I want you to experience this thing the way I experienced it uh, mm -hmm. or the way I'm experiencing it now, like four years later when I'm editing the to you, What so. <laughs> would you say to musicians that are trying to make it, not necessarily make it big or anything like that, but to make it with the concept that they want, that they want to get out in the world? What kind of advice would you give them? Something that helped you? Yeah. Uh, so it is uh, maybe going to sound a little bit off the shelf and maybe going to sound a little bit generic, but it is um, applicable to... Uh, music to your professional life and to your personal life the first thing is understand who you are understand yourself uh, and understand what what you're trying to achieve why are you trying to achieve that mm -hmm. what is your motivation and there are no wrong answers so uh, I you know I really don't like if somebody uh, says like oh yeah uh, they're just chasing fame and money why is that wrong like if that if that is what they want to achieve that is perfectly fine. Uh, if somebody is constantly playing and they never want to play live uh, and somebody says, why do you even bother playing? <laughs> that does not align with your vision, but maybe that's their vision. Maybe that's, yeah. you know, what, what they need. So it is very, very important to understand first what, what you need and are you uh, on a good path uh, to achieve that thing that you need and that makes you happy and i know that happy is a loaded term but that makes you satisfied that, that gives you something back for all the effort that you're putting into it uh yeah. and uh effort is also a very big keyword so uh yes talent is important but uh it's x percent talent and y percent persistence and uh you know all of that <laughs> seems to be true yeah and it's true i mean so uh on one hand i can say that uh you know 
my composing skills are bad because I'm not as talented as uh, Dam or Tarkalion, but it is partially true. It's also partially that I did not invest 20 years of my life uh, filling every single empty spot with music, composing music, etc. I filled it with writing code. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and am I a talented coder? Sure, maybe my brain is 1% more mathematical than some other person's, but that's 1%. That's not uh, mm. everything. Everything. Around. Most of all, you've put the work into it. Yes. So. I mean, the, the very, very uh, annoying, uh, did you put 10,000 hours into it? <laughs> I don't know what's the number of hours, right? But, uh, it also, but it's a lot. It, it is a lot. And it's also, does that process make you happy? Uh, and again, yeah. Let's not chase happiness, but that, does it give you back what? meaning, purpose? Yes, yes. So, yeah. th does it give you something back? Uh, and is that worth it? Uh, and so, the worth is also a very loaded term because what? When does it? When? When? When is it really worth it? Uh, and there, again, again, up, up to you to yes discover. Yeah. And then, uh, so that, that is very uh, individualistic start, but uh, very important to start at that place. And then you start asking those questions in a, a wider uh, audience, which is your band, assuming that you're not uh, one, one person. One man, uh, one person. <laughs> um, and I mean, if you are, that's good. But uh, if you have people around you, it's very important to understand uh, what are your roles and responsibilities uh, and what are uh, your shared goals uh, and are yeah. your individual goals aligned Compatible. in that shared mm -hmm. goal? Uh, are the other people there to um, to actively participate in that shared goal? Uh, is And uh, I'm going to give an example of our uh, uh, rhythm guitarist who came and said, look, I'm going to play with you always but do not expect me to be part of creative process. I don't mm -hmm. have the time, I don't have the capacity for that. I love the music uh, and yeah. he plays, you know, uh, impeccably. And like, those are, those are my boundaries. Yeah. And, and I thanked him from the bottom of my heart because that is the best thing somebody can, can do. Set very clear boundaries, set very clear participation rules, and you know yes. how to play with that. And then you don't have uh, you know, like the disappointments of uh, we are doing this together and then one person does it, the other doesn't. And, uh, mm -hmm. so it's, Mismatched uh, expectations, that happens all the time. Yes, and mm -hmm. it is it is very important. And again, this translates to anything you do in life. It's very important to, to have, and I know it sounds bureaucratic, but to have a contract uh, with the people uh, around you, uh, just out of respect and out of uh, mutual satisfaction. Uh, and to uh, enjoy yourself uh, while you're doing that, because uh, after all, it's supposedly creating something that's beautiful, uh, as grotesque, as uh, abstract, as whatever it might be. Uh, it is your uh, personal output. It, it is uh, there to make other people happy, sad, uh, think uh, or not think or relax or whatever. But uh, Touch them in some way, yeah, yes. affect yeah. them. And, yes. Uh, again, I just realized that uh, I made it sound as you have to do it for other people with my last statement because you're touching other people. You can also do it for yourself. Uh, but uh, I think that the context of the question was in performing and uh, playing for others. And then I think you're doing it for the others as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. And I, I think like anyone who listens to you would understand it correctly. Uh, both are intertwined anyway, because it's the nature of the performing. That uh, it can't be only for you, but it's always for the people that receive it as well. So it, it's both. But uh, that's, that's really insightful. And I hope people that are starting out or that have had a bit of years behind their back playing can take something out of this and yeah i find it insightful so thanks very much for that and tell us of course where we can support you best so anyone who's listening to us or wants to now get into carnival of flesh and what you're about uh, where can they find you yeah so uh we're digital like everybody else you can find us in everything mm -hmm. Uh, you can go on carnivalflesh.com or if that's too long for you to type, you can type flesh.is. 
Uh, and, oh, okay. uh, you know, if you want to see the Tropical Plunder video, flash.is slash tropical. See it. So, so look at it. Tropical. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you want to listen to our latest album, Anthems of Extinction, uh, Flesh is Anthems. Uh, so, you know, it's easy, it's catchy. Uh, mm -hmm. we would, even though we're digital, we would invite you to invest in our merch, not because we need to pay the bills, uh, because that's not going to yep. happen anytime soon, but uh, we would like you to experience uh, the physical manifestation of our new album, which is a nice little book with... Uh, I forget how many pages of artwork, uh, and we really take that part seriously as well. Uh, so um, that is where you can start. If you're in Serbia and listening to this, uh, hello, how are we doing? Uh, <laughs> I hope that uh, you'll be able to see us live uh, in a couple of months. If you're in Europe, uh, well, um, reach out because we definitely want to do another European tour. Uh, and if you are outside of Europe and uh, you would like to see us touring, uh, I hope you're a tour organizer because we do have a van, but a uh, van <laughs> does not go into the United States, so... <laughs> mm -hmm. Some support needed before, yeah, please <laughs> offer that. <laughs> thanks so much again, uh, Dark, for this uh, conversation. Uh, thanks for anyone who was listening to us and tuned to this episode. That's it for um, the Stellar Sound podcast today, and I see tonight because now it's already dark. <laughs> That's the type of season we're in. Anyways, so I hope to see you all guys and hear your feedback very soon. And for you, Darko, we're going to reconnect when you've toured because I want to get the impression after on the journey. Absolutely.